Um, I will return your exam sometime next week. I've gotten through about grading half of them, but um, I can kind of iterate back and forth and decide, you know, how detrimental was an error. And so after I see the whole distribution of everybody, then I try to come up with something that's reasonable. Um, there were certainly enough easy problems on the exam that you could bolster your score. And then there were, you know, maybe some minor snacks. Anything that's like killing you? It's like, I just need to know I can't, I'm not going to survive the weekend unless I know the answer to something. There was one little wrinkle in there. Um, and it was, maybe you needed to find the expectation of the variance of an inverse gamma. We don't spend a lot of time memorizing all of that. Let me just show you how to do it with an expectation. Now, if you weren't able to do that, um, where the problem comes from is in the, the, I'll just work through problem one on the exam just real quickly. So problem one, there's a few issues right here that I've seen in my um, early attempt at grading. It says something like x i's are exponentially distributed and exponentials look something like this. So lambda e to the minus lambda x. And so that's one parameterization of it. There's other parameterizations. I don't think it would help you that much. But you could flip over the, the lambda, like some people will do. Um, you might recognize this as a gamma distribution as well. So what is this? This thing right here is a gamma, where alpha is 1. And at least in my parameterization, that beta term is lambda. And so they're constrained. Um, gamut distributions. They're super important distributions in counting processes, so it usually represents in a memoryless problem, um, in a memoryless memory process. It's the waiting time in between events that happen. Maybe we can fill in some, some little details, but exponentials are the only continuous distribution that do that, that have that property. Um, maybe I'll tell you more about that problem. a little bit later. Um, does anybody know what the discrete analog is to that, the memoryless distribution? Yeah, geometrics do it. Yeah, cool. So the more you know about distributions, the easier these things are. So some of you that haven't studied a lot of distributions for a long time, this class is going to be a little bit harder. And if you do new properties of your distributions, this class is a little bit easier. So I kind of am fully aware there's a bimodal distribution here too. And it always presents. So we'll look at the grades also next week when I give you back your scores. It's almost sure to have two humps in it. There'll be a lot of people over 90, and then there'll be this other hump. So I don't want you all to panic. So I don't do something where if you're over 90, you get an A. It's usually closer to 75 is usually what that looks like. Um, I will give you an opportunity to do makeups for half credit. So you can get the difference between your score in 100, and if you do everything on the exam and it looks real quick, real good, I'll give you the, the differential. So that'll help you out. And I'll also probably give a, an MCMC extra credit assignment as well, something like that. So test taking isn't the only thing in town, but I still like it because it, it gets you guys to really try to sit down and study. So we'll do another exam as well. OK. Um, if we're going to find the posterior distribution, now I didn't say what's the conjugate prior for lambda because you could have done it on one over lambda or one over beta, which would be lambda if you wanted to do that, and that would be an inverse Wishart. But if you did it on lambda, it really doesn't help you. It might get you to some other step in the problem that you recognize a little bit better, but you still have to do the same the same math. Um, so the posterior distribution for lambda is just likelihood times prior. And the conjugate prior, in this case, is gamma. I think almost everybody got that. Um, so this is going to look like this. The likelihood function, so that's going to look like lambda e to the minus lambda xi. And then times the prior. That's going to look like lambda to the alpha minus 1, e to the minus lambda beta. One error that I did see come up a couple times is some people took this product 
can multiply it in their prior. And so that's a mistake. The prior only comes up once. There's only one lambda in there. And so you don't multiply the prior over and over again. So there's braces in here. Those braces are important. So likelihood times a prior, not product over the prior. So, so this is going to be lambda to the end. There's n of those. I'll just absorb these right now, alpha minus 1. And then I've got e to the minus lambda. This product sign comes over. And so I have a sum of the xi's. And then I've got this beta in here. And so again, there's just one beta. There's only one alpha in all of that. And so we recognize this thing is, again, n plus alpha, um, some of the xi's plus beta. So, that will get you 10 points on that problem, just doing that. So the posterior predictive distribution is kind of fun. So some people try to take this one step too far, and it kind of indicated something to me. So if you're going to come up with a posterior predictive, you're going to do this. This is going to be proportional to, well, it will really be equal to this thing right here, um, lambda e to the minus lambda x tilde. I saw some people product across this thing. So there's only one predictive point in all of that. So times your gamma distribution. So times this thing, which has kernel of that. So d lambda. And so we can just make this all proportional and just write in what we've already solved for n plus alpha minus 1, e to the minus lambda sum of the xi's plus beta. And we can absorb some terms. We're going to integrate over lambda and all of that. We integrate between 0 and infinity because that's the support of lambda. And so we do something really similar to what we did before. We'll just collect terms and recognize the kernel of this. So lambda. So this is n plus alpha plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1. And I wouldn't absorb that plus 1 and the minus 1 because it helps me to recognize the kernel of the distribution. So I usually leave that one in there. Let me just circle that. That plus 1 is for the predictive point. So this will look like e to the minus lambda some of that, you know what it is. Lambda to the x tilde plus some of the xi's plus alpha plus beta. And we're going to integrate over that. And we probably know how to do that. It's going to be the inverse of the normalizing constant. Alpha tilde, we'll call that beta tilde. I know all about gamma distribution, so piece of cake. This thing is going to be proportional to gamma alpha tilde over beta, beta tilde to the alpha tilde. And this thing is going to be proportional to this thing raised to that thing. So again, this is all going to be a constant in here. What goes into the gamma function. And so this is just going to be proportional to x tilde plus some of the xi's plus beta raised to the minus n plus alpha plus 1. And a lot of people were able to write this down. If you just wrote this and you didn't write that right there, you'd miss a point or so. So that it's like you know a little bit more about this integral. And you can actually write it down um, almost, almost analytically, everything that you need to know. Let me ask a question. What distribution is that? Pareto. It's a Pareto. So, very good. It's a type 2 Pareto. Most people won't know that. It's not a T. And so some people identify it as a T, and it, it kind of looks like a T. How do you know that this thing isn't a T? Yeah, it's, it never takes on negative values. So T's take on negative values, and X tilde has to be positive because it came from an exponential. So it's a type of Pareto distribution. And if you've studied that in reliability theory or something like that, kudos. So you didn't need to know that. 
um, to get too far on this. So the last part was find the expected value. I'm not going to write out the variance one for us. It's the same idea. And if you know how to manipulate variances and second moments and first moments, you can do the same trick that I'm going to show you. So if I wanted something like this, x tilde given x, I write down this is x expectation of x tilde given lambda in x expectation and this is going to be condition on x right here and so I need to find the expectation of x tilde given lambda in x the x doesn't help me because I've already conditioned on all the information so get rid of that and this is the only thing I need to know. And I know what the expectation of x tilde given lambda is. What is it? Whatever lambda. A lot of people got, were like, uh oh. So, a good test taking strategy would be to identify what you know about this thing and tell me what you didn't know and what you would need to do. I will, I will kind of point out. It's kind of an interesting social phenomenon these days. I last gave this problem in 2019, so I was aware of this issue. I'll admit in 2019, I, I, hadn't, thought to, I hadn't thought that this could create a little bit of a mess for you all, but I had everybody come up and ask me, what to do about this? And nowadays, people don't do that anymore. So anyway, it's an interesting cultural shift. So I probably would have told you. So, but at the same time, it doesn't matter, you know? And so, it's not gonna make any difference in your grade whether you knew it or didn't. What I want you to recognize is that has some distribution. What distribution does that follow? It's inverse gamma. So we know that lambda given x is gamma. And so if you didn't know what an inverse gamma is, it's when you invert the random variable. And so it's that, so it's an inverse gamma and just identifying that and saying, I don't know what the expectation of the variance are, that was pretty close to full credit. I'd probably mark off one point for that. Um, but if you wanted to figure it out, you could do it and spend you know, all the time you've saved at the end of the exam and start whittling away at that thing. And I'm not sure anybody did that. So, but let me just show you how to do it. So let's just start with a gamma distribution. We know all about gamma distributions. So a gamma distribution looks like this. F of x given alpha and beta is going to be beta and the alpha over gamma alpha. You probably need to know about the normalizing constant a little bit to be able to do this properly. Um, this will be x to the alpha minus 1 e to the minus theta x. So really quickly, what's an inverse gamma look like? Maybe you don't remember, but it's easy to transform. So let's just do a transform. z is equal to 1 over x. Quick question, is that a 1 to 1 transform? <laughs> it is. So because we're positive, everything's positive in all of this. So x is equal to 1 over z, the easiest inverse function to probably play around with. So I just replace everywhere I see an x with a 1 over z there, and I get an inverse gamma, but I need to be careful, and I need to take my derivatives as well. So my derivative of z inverse dz, absolute value of that thing is minus z to the minus 2 absolute value. So, z to the minus 2. So I just come up with my inverse gamma. Keep in mind, alpha and beta being the exact same things. And when you look at tables, they're at least sensible that they use usually the same letters for everything. They do mean the same thing. So all I'm going to do is just transform everything. So I'll take my beta to the alpha. That's the same, gamma to the alpha, gamma alpha. I'll plug in my 1 over z. This will be to the alpha minus 1. 
So if you'd like, I could change that to Z minus plus. Right there. Flip everything over, it changed the sign and the exponent. E to the minus beta over Z. So the Z is upside down now. And I need to multiply in that thing as well. So I've got minus two of these, and I have plus one of those. And so Z to the minus two, I'll collect it right there. There's already one of those. Subtract off one, goes to zero. Subtract off another, goes to minus one. So that's what an inverse gamma looks like. Still haven't answered the question, what is the expectation of the variance? We'll just do the expectation. And if you had done this, I would give you 100%. So saying that, if you didn't do this, you'd miss a point. If you kind of just recognize that you didn't know the answer. Now I will say, for people that threw in lambda right there and thought that it was gamma and made the problem simpler, that's probably minus two or something like that. So as long as you have kind of the right setup and you're following the steps and right, wrote down the formulas kind of correctly, um, I'm obviously gonna get the person that recognized this is an inverse gamma more of an award than the people that didn't recognize that. So, but at the same time, it, it's not gonna break your heart when you get your score back on this problem. So, let's just think about how to do this. Uh, you might be thinking this is a messy parts problem, but it's, it's a little bit simpler if you take things that you know. So I'll just write down the expectation of Z is equal to the integral of Z times all of this stuff. And I'll leave in normalizing constant. Gamma to the gamma alpha, Z to the minus alpha minus one, E to the minus Z beta. So we're going to integrate over z. This is the expectation of z. And this would go from 0 to infinity. And so I can already see one thing I can combine. It doesn't really change the form of this thing too much, the expectation. And that's going to be good. So I can get rid of that and get rid of that right there. So collect my z. I've got one extra z, so it pulls out that minus 1. So this is just equal to beta alpha over gamma alpha, z to the minus alpha, e to the minus z, oops, that's what Sarah didn't like. Oh, yeah. Was that it? Yeah. Okay. I can sometimes tell when people don't like me, but I can never tell why. I can speculate. So same thing, I don't know how to solve this integral. So it seems like a, a big mess. Let's put it into a form that we're more familiar with solving, into the gamma form. So we're just gonna do this transformation back the other way. And turn it into an integral we're at least used to looking at. So we'll just unwind that little step. If you knew what an inverse gamma looked like, you would have just written that down from the get-go. But again, it's an easy transform. So this thing right here, if I end up replacing z is equal to 1 over x, and then I take my derivative with respect to x, x inverse, absolute value, I come up with x to the minus 2, just like we did before. So same factor. So this is going to be integral beta to the alpha, gamma alpha, and then I'll just substitute 1 over x in here to the minus alpha. I could exchange that sign. I'm going to plug this thing in. x to the minus 2 right there. So there's my Jacobian term. And I'll just change this part. e to the minus beta x. So when I see that, I see z. I put in 1 over x, so it gets multiplied on top. These are the same integrals. And if you like, you can do that right there. So just change that down and around. So this is the answer to that right there. And this is in a form that we're pretty familiar with. So let me just get rid of that right there. I'll put in x, change that to a plus, 
and I'll absorb this minus 2. So this is going to be alpha to the minus 2. And I don't like that. So I like it written a little bit differently. I want it to be alpha minus 1 minus 1. Because I like this right here. I'm really familiar with that. And so you could sit there and you could play around with it and just solve that part and use the integrating constant from a gamma distribution. You know which gamma di distribution it is. You could do that, factorize this stuff out, and solve for everything you need. Or I could just change this in one step over to the right gamma sort of thing. So I want this to be a minus 1 right here. So how do I make that a minus 1? I'm going to back that out just a little bit. Integral, 0 to infinity. So I want to do that, but I can't just do that. I need to multiply by beta to do that. Same exact thing. So question is, and so I need to pre and post multiply by, by beta. So that's the same thing. I absorb that beta right here. I want that to look like a minus one in there. So what do you do? What's that? Ball of alpha. Not alpha. Keep in mind this. Gamma function of some something is equal to n minus one factorial. It's so easy mistake, right? It's like, which way does it go? Is it the plus one? Is it the minus one? But if you, if you remember this, and maybe you'll remember it after seeing this. So I don't pull out alpha. The biggest term in here is alpha minus 1. And I want to cancel that one out. So alpha minus 1 times alpha minus 1. I haven't done anything right here. But this thing cancels out one of those. So that's now. So alpha minus 1 divided by gamma function of alpha minus 1. And I'll let you check this at home. So that turns it into gamma function of alpha minus 1. So you can use all your rules that you know about factorials. It behaves the same. This is a super interesting function, gamma functions in general. You can plug in negative values for that. And it is a really trippy looking function. So not on the positive side, but on the negative side. I'd say look at, look at Wikipedia to see how interesting gamma functions are. Anyway, we're there. So now I can pull that thing out. I'll just get rid of that and plug it out, pull it out right here. And I know what that integrates to. So again, you didn't have to do all the factorization stuff. You could have just solved for the other thing that the um, alpha over beta and it would have factorized everything just fine. So this whole thing right here, this integral is one. And so what I'm left with is that, beta over alpha minus one. So good practice to always play around with your probability distributions. That will always help you out in the future. So when you're bored on Friday night, you know, you don't know what to do with yourself, your friends are already out, pull out your probability book. So, and play with that for a few hours. You'll cure your boredom. But I, I think that that is actually good practice. Pull out your probability books, your inference books, every once in a while, do a problem. And so and you'll retain it. Again, this didn't foul up anybody. It's not going to change their grade if you knew how to do this or if you didn't. But again, if you did go through the effort and figure out why the expectation of a gamma distribution is alpha over beta, you would have been able to do this. So, any questions? I'll try to have scores. I'm not sure if I'll have them on Monday or Wednesday, but it'll be next week. Then we'll talk over the distribution. Um, in the meantime, don't panic, just study stuff. And so there'll be a pathway to improve your grade. Let's do Jeffrey's prior. I know I've said this before, but I'll, I'll say it just one more time. I don't care how you accumulate the points throughout the class. All I care about is whether you get it at the end. It's 
So if you understand the material at the end, that's what I care about the most, and I'll recognize that. So I'll walk you through my grading a little bit more um, next week, but if you've taken one of my classes before, it's all that stuff where I'll weight things and look at different things, and I'll come up with five different versions of your grade, and I'll take the highest one. And if you happen to on the raw scale of my grade, the way I have it enumerated in my syllabus, if somebody doesn't get picked up by that letter, but they were in front of you in the raw tabulation, I'll pick up that person too. So that the ordering is still the same. So again, what I, what I don't want is very minor things to affect your grade. So I'll make sure that that doesn't happen. A good way to, to bolster your grade is make sure you turn in all your homework and get all of those points. Okay, Jeffrey's book. So let's just write down some stuff. This is what we said last time. So we know how to transform distributions. So say I have some distribution, um, I'll write down P, I'll say V, so say I have some distribution, um, let me write it down like this. So say we have P theta. And I'm interested in playing around with this transformation. G inverse B is equal to theta. So I just wrote it down already, taking the inverse of everything. So I've just implied that the inverse exists. Again, this isn't, um, we're not losing any generality by saying that the transform is invert invertible. If it weren't invertible, you're still dealing with a function somewhere, and so you should be able to chop it into sections that are invertible. And so, same thing as always. So say we have this, we know that distribution, and we want to find P feet. Let's just be clear about what P means for a moment. So, pretty easy to do. Just apply our rule. P feet, given V is equal to P theta. I'm going to write down theta in terms of feet. And then we'll take our derivative. And another way to write this would be like this. PV is equal to P theta. So that's just P theta up there, even though we've written it a little bit different. I know what theta is, it's G inverse V. We can do the same thing here. So this is the rule of transformations. And so all probability distributions share this property. And so if you're going to integrate over something, you're going to need this Jacobian term. So we need to stretch the space and make sure that we're thinking about volumes and areas the right way. But we're used to this equation. So functions that share this um, relationship are transform invariant. And so you give me, so for instance, maybe I'm thinking of theta as sigma squared. Maybe I'm thinking of phi as phi, the precision parameter. And I can go back and forth between those two things, write down distributions that might look different in terms of their syntax, but they're exactly the same distributions. There's a one-to-one -one transform between them, and so one of those dis density functions is on phi, and the other one would be on the other random variable. In that case, I would call that sigma squared or phi. We'll look at that example in a minute. So this relationship right here tells me that P's are transform invariant. That I can move back and forth by applying this equation and it maps me back and forth between these two spaces. But these functions have exactly the same information. In them. The P's have exactly the information. So in terms of my variance or my Precision analysis, one of them's a gamma and one of them's an inverse gamma, but I've needed the Jacobian term. 
to map back and forth, just like we did in the example we just looked at. So that's a key relationship. So this is the key. Just keep in mind, you usually don't map likelihoods like that, just back and forth. And so you have to be a little bit more careful with likelihoods, but likelihoods are kind of assuming, I've taken the sampling representation, I'm thinking of that variable as a fixed variable. Once you start differentiating over something or integrating over something, you're gonna need the determinant term. Before you do that, you don't need it. If I just took likelihoods and I didn't have this this term right here, and I just flipped them around, I would come up with different answers for my problems. So if I didn't include that Jacobian term and I transformed, I wouldn't be able to transform that answer back to the original answer. So that's critical. This is the chain rule, is all this is. This is just chain rule stuff. We have to adhere to it if we're gonna be integrating over stuff. Okay, there's another function out there that shares this property. So I'll just write down our information, and I'll tell you what this is in a second, has this exact same property. And we'll prove this in a moment. So this is gonna be, I've already made a mistake, so I'll just carry this through. It, the information doesn't have the exact same property. The information has this property right here. D theta, D phi, squared. We'll prove that in a moment. So we do know if I take the square root of both sides, I'm left with something with this same key relationship. V theta, V phi. We'll prove this in a couple minutes. Plus you. So what that means, when we see this, after we prove that this is true, what it means is that the information to the half power is transform invariant. So meaning I can go back and forth. If you give me information for the, um, information for theta, take the half power of it, I can transform directly using a very similar rule that we wrote down right here and get the information on phi and I can go back and forth. I'll need a Jacobian to do it. So, and I don't have to work out from scratch what the information is on all these different scales. I can just transform it using a rule that looks just like this, but it's being applied to I to the one half. Let me show you what this function looks like. Oh, and I, I will point out that Jeffrey's prior what I just wrote down for theta is I theta to the one half. So I'll call this pi Jeffries. I'll call it pi Jeff. That's what the Jeffries prior is. Now what it says to us if we use this prior, if somebody's working with theta, and they calculate this prior using the definition of information, and you're working with phi and you use that same information function and you work out the information on phi, if you apply this rule, we'll be able to map back and forth to each other. So I'm just gonna plug this thing in as a dis distribution on theta and phi, and I'll be able to map back and forth just like we were able to map back and forth between probability densities. So we'll be able to apply that same rule to this thing and we'll get exactly the same answer back, going back and forth. That's what it means to be transform invariant. So it means if two scientists follow this rule and they're operating on the same sampling distribution but they parameterized it differently and they come up with this Jeffries prior, even though their answers may be represented by two different distribution, there's a one-to-one -one connection between them and they can move back and forth between them and get exactly the same answers. Okay, this is what the information looks like. So Fisher's input.
is equal to this. Derivative d theta f, I'll say logarithm, f x given theta and you square this. So that's the typical definition of Fisher's information. So keep in mind, this thing is an expectation with respect to x, provided theta. So all of this is conditional on theta, if you like to write it that way, or write it this way. So the expectation is with respect to x. Now, when I talk about this, I talk about this as a likelihood function right here, and I'm operating on theta when I take this derivative right here. So we're kind of thinking about this function in a, a dual manner. We're going to operate in terms of x and we're going to operate in terms of theta. So it's a sampling distribution. It's kind of like a likelihood. It's still the exact same formula that we'd be familiar with. We'll look at a couple examples. So, but as soon as I start operating on theta and I'm thinking about the stretch of the space, I am going to need um, Jacobians. Okay, I'll just say sometimes there's an easier representation. Sometimes it's easier. Sometimes we can write expectation of one derivative on the logarithm of f of x given theta squared is equal to the minus expectation of the second derivative of the log likelihood. The log of that function, whatever that thing is. And when I can apply this, sometimes I like having both things in my quiver because Sometimes one's easier to work with than the other. So you know the game. Same thing as in calculus, you like three different ways to solve a problem, and your teacher will try to value you up. You know, make sure you know all three of them and set up problems and test you on all three. I won't try to make anything intentionally difficult, but I guarantee we will do one of these on the final exam. Okay. Um, I have played around in cases where you couldn't use this and you could only use the other one. I probably will not do that. I didn't feel that that was very successful the first time I did that on a test. So it'll probably be the case that you can just apply either one and it'll work out fine. Um, okay, or at least I'll say that this relationship is, is true. When is this true? Does anybody know what the sometimes is? Well, yeah, it better be twice differentiable. <laughs> it does. It's true. We use it all the time in exponential family stuff. So in all your first year of stats classes, you're probably going back and forth between these two things. So let's just see when it's true. Let's, let's first prove this, and then we'll come back, probably get through this, and then we'll do a few examples, and then we'll do the Jeffries proof on Monday, establishing that connection between the information to the half powers. You can almost see that it's true almost instantly. So just by looking at this, by transforming, I'm going to need to apply the chain rule because I'm taking derivatives, and that other term is going to slide right out because it has nothing to do with x. So that's what the proof looks like. You could do it in this form as well. You'd have to do two derivatives, take the absolute value of it, and you'd have to know properties of derivatives, but you could actually pull that out as a square. So we'll work with this form when we do the proof. For some of our examples, we'll use this one. Okay. Um, let's establish that this is true. So let's show, I'll say star star. I think I've already used star for the key relationship. Let's show star star is true. And let's figure out what the sign sometimes means. 
should be able to see it just in the proof what condition needs to be true. Let's just work on this for a second. We'll take expectations later. I want to point out this thing is always positive over here. There's a minus sign out in front of here. We know this is positive. Expectations are positive. Things had better be positive. The only thing that goes into the expectation is something else that's positive. It's the sampling distribution, sampling density. It's not obvious that that is positive. But if we're able to establish the connection, you know that this thing has to be positive. So if you're ever working with this form right here, and it turns out to be negative, either you forgot that negative sign, or there's an error in your map. So, good sanity check. So let's just look at the this part, this chunk. So d, d theta log, it's not going to be enough to show that this is that. They're not the same. But once I take the expectation over it, something goes to zero. f of x given theta. So this thing, and I'll say this thing squared, is going to be equal to, take the derivative of log, this is one that I can still remember how to do. So this is 1 over f of x given theta, and now I have to apply the chain rule. So this is d, d theta, f of x given theta. So the derivative of log is 1 over that thing, and then you have to apply the chain rule to it. So that's about as far as we can go with that. Let's look at the thing on the right-hand side. Let's just look at this quantity as well. We'll keep in mind we've got a negative sign that we need to think about. So if we mess this up at the end, um, it's because of that minus sign. say second derivative with respect to theta of the logarithm of f of x given theta. And I will point out, if this is a, a high dimensional example, you would want to plug in all your high d data. x would be a high dimensional thing that you'd be integrating over. But if everything is iid, you might already recognize what happens, that I'm going to have a product over all the Xi's, when I take the logarithm of that product, if they're all IID, these are all the same things, and you can factorize out an N out in front of it. And so it doesn't matter that you do that because the Jeffries prior is always defined up to proportionality. And so that N won't affect anything. So I usually do this just on one data point. In the IID case, I always do it with just one data point. Okay. So we'll just do our first derivative and we'll save our second derivative. So this is going to look like same thing. First derivative is 1 over f of x given theta times the derivative, no, one derivative of f of x theta. Let me just do a quick simplification over here. This is f of x inverse given theta times the derivative of f of x given theta squared. Let's come back to this and write it down the same way. This will be a derivative over f of x inverse given theta derivative d theta f of x given theta. The only reason I do this is because I refuse to remember what the quotient rule is. I do remember what it is, but I don't think I've ever used it. I always use the product rule. So we need to apply the product rule. And there'll be two terms here. So I'm going to take a derivative over one of the things, multiply it by the other, and then do the other thing and add it in. So I'll take the derivative over that one first. D There'll be two derivatives on theta. So I'm doing this one first, and then I'll multiply it against that thing right there. So two derivatives, f of x given theta, times 
at inverse x given theta. So that's one of my terms. I'll be real clear about this. That derivative is not extending over here. So plus, I'll take the derivative of this one. And so that's going to be uh, minus sign comes down. Minus f of x given theta, the minus 2, so I decrement my exponent. I need to now multiply by this. This is going to be d, d theta, f of x given theta. My question is, is, the, is that correct? I missed something. So when I took the derivative of this, I need to apply the chain rule one more time. And what's the chain rule term? It's that term again. This term that I wrote down was just that one, but since there's two of them multiplying together, that's squared. I will point out to you, this thing right here looks just like that. Squaring the derivative, squaring the inverse term. So that derivative is squared, and this is an inverse term that's been squared. And that minus sign we're actually in good shape with, that will cancel that minus sign. But we're left with this other creature right here. And that's certainly not a zero. But when we take the expectation, sometimes it is a zero. So let's just do that. So the expectation of two derivatives f of x given theta times f of x given theta inverse. So I just want to show that once we slide the expectation over this first term right here, it's zero. The expectation over all of this stuff times the multiply sign really is just that thing right here. So, this thing right here is equal to the integral of two derivatives over f of x given theta. Put that in braces so you know where the operator ends. This is going to be f of x given theta invert times my sampling distribution. We're taking an expectation. So I need to take all of this stuff, multiply it by the sampling distribution, and then integrate over x. Something beautiful happens. Those cancel. And I'm left with this. Integral d, two derivatives on theta, f of x given theta, dx. And we're hoping that this is 0. And if it is 0, we're a half line away from completing the proof. The question is, is when is that zero? It's zero when we can do this. So if I can pull that outside, then I have the derivative of the integral of the sampling density, which is one. And then as soon as I hit it with one of those derivatives, it's zero. If I hit it with the other derivative, it's still zero. So this is called Fubini's theorem. Um, when you can when you can iterate, when you can interchange these, I'll tell you if there's a theta on the boundary. So if your theta defines the boundary of the space, you will not be able to interchange those. So if this has anything to do with theta and the bounds over here. So if you're playing around with something like a uniform zero theta and you're integrating from zero to theta, um, you can't do this. And this would not be a valid form for the information, but this one would. So this is when Fubini's applies. So this is checking to see when I can interchange this thing, and that's my sometimes. So my sometimes is Fubini's. So if Fubini's applies, then we can do this. And you can't always do it. So that thing is just going to be derivative d theta, two of those, 
integral f of x given theta dx, and this thing is 1. So the derivative of 1 is equal to 0. The last half line is to just plug in everything else in the expectation. So the expectation of this thing is the expectation of that thing. They're exactly the same creatures. And I almost have that thing right here. I'm off by this negative sign, so the expectation of this thing right here is the expectation of that. I'm left with this negative sign, and that's where that negative sign comes up. So they're the same as long as you can interchange the, the derivative in the expectation operator. Sam, you got a question? I'm just trying to figure out where that square symbol comes from. I where this one? Yeah, I got lost there. That one right there? Yeah. This was when I took the derivative with respect to, so I, I was left with this right here. So I had one of those terms, which is that term. Then I took the derivative of that, which is that, and the negative sign, and I had to do the chain rule. Okay. Oh, <laughs> there's the other one. So just to be clear, the derivative of d theta f inverse x given theta is equal to f minus 2 x given theta minus 1 times the derivative of f, f of x given theta. So that's what that was. So just a little bit more chain rule, chain rule twice. We'll come back next time. We will do a few examples with this, show you stuff that you're already familiar with that match up to the priors that we've been using, and then we'll complete with uh, the information. That's it for now, you guys. Have a great weekend. And let's talk about midterms later.